Hello, uh, my name is David Sherman, and I'm here uh, to deliver one of the keynote addresses to the DEA conference. And I'm doing it from my home in Newton, Massachusetts, because the COVID-19 virus has, not, has made it impossible to have a conference in person this July, one of the first times I think that the DEA conference has been done this way. So I'm going to do my best to deliver a keynote address that will be hopefully of some interest. Uh, and I'll tell you to begin with that I was invited with no particular uh, purpose, no particular subject in mind. Uh, and normally a person gives a, a keynote address about some research topic and some views. Uh, I have a special place in this subject because I'm really kind of one of the oldest that was working on this. I was working on this when it was really just in its earliest stages with Bill Cooper in 1978. So uh, that is the um, large part of what I'll be talking about today. I'll be offering my perspective on the development, the early days of DEA, a little bit of historical notes, and also a little bit of the development of how certain things evolved to apply DEA to certain types of problems. Uh, and uh, you'll see what my direction was as compared to many others that you've uh, uh, been hearing to in this conference, that you've studied, that you've read about, and on and on. So I'm David Sherman, I'm a professor at Northeastern University. Uh, I've been there for uh, quite a long time now. Um, and so let me just call up the first screen and uh, uh, we'll see how this all works out. Let's see. So indeed, this is the conference. Um, and um, I was invited here by Professor Lin, and Professor Zhu. Um, it's the uh, conference that uh, I think Professor Zhu has been running uh, for quite a number of years, uh, sometimes uh, in Asia, sometimes in Europe. And uh, this time it was supposed to be in, in South Korea. And I guess uh, uh, we all understand that it's the virus that has made it impossible to do that. So I'll be talking about the early days of DEA. And uh, the early days of DEA is with uh, Bill Cooper. Bill Cooper, W.W. W. Cooper, was one of the originators of the of DEA with uh, Abe Charnes and Ed Rhodes. Um, and uh, I started because I was at a, uh, I was getting my doctorate at Harvard Business School. I was really just right out of there. I had, I had worked before in public accounting. I had, got my MBA from Harvard Business School, so I already had been to the, to the place and was coming back now and uh, didn't know what to expect. And I walk in to uh, meet Professor Cooper, Bill Cooper. Um, he actually uh, was very kind in that uh, he looked over my application and uh, was giving me advice to suggest how it might be um, improved to make it more attracted for the school and eventually I was admitted and then the first thing I knew I was in the Cooper seminar and uh, the first thing I remember is he was concerned about effectiveness and efficiency which he defined as do the right job do the job right it was really one of the driving forces in a lot of his work um, and uh, at that time uh, DEA was being run by running linear programming the programs time after time. In other words, if you had 35 uh, organizations you were comparing, you'd have to run it 35 times. And if you change it a little bit, you have to run it 35 times again. Um, so things were pretty slow. Uh, we had no codes to really do this. Um, and uh, I was uh, an accounting type person. Um, and uh, I had done some, I had been in management. I was, was in, involved in some small businesses. I was actually the uh, Controller, the financial officer of the Museum of Fine Arts of Boston. I had been working with PwC and at the time it was Cooper's and Library. Um, and I was also very interested in nonprofits. I had I worked with, with uh, at Cooper's and Library, included my clients, included Harvard, Harvard University. I was the really running much of the order at Harvard University, and I had the Conservatory of Music. And so nonprofits were a great interest to me. And I had then gone to the Museum of Fine Arts of Boston to try out some of my ideas in nonprofits. And uh, along the way, I also got very interested in services because most of these nonprofits are 
service organizations and uh, um, the income statement that the accountants you know use as a key measure of financial performance doesn't really say a lot about a nonprofit because their objective is not to make a profit their objective is to provide as much service and high quality as possible resources uh, it has so I saw it at this Cooper seminar, this DEA technique, which looked like it might be useful because I could look at things like a nonprofit where the outputs could be measured in units and I could compare them. And it was not a question of um, whether it's a profit, it was really which, which unit, which organization was able to produce their types of services, their, their types of outputs um, more effectively than anybody else, or actually more efficiently than anybody else. Um, so it seemed like a great idea, and um, so the question was, does it work? And the answer was, yes. Now, this is sort of, again, this is the early days of the EA. Um, and of course, in the early days, trying to get things published was very difficult. Um, there were a lot of skeptics. There are probably still many around today, but there were a lot of skeptics. There was resistance in the journals. Uh, it was not as statistically uh, driven as other techniques and therefore was not traditional. Um, uh, so uh, it, it was a new method. And actually, as uh, was once mentioned by uh, Dr. Bose, the person who created Bose speakers, he, he once at MIT put on the board, better equals different equals fear. And that may be why people were hesitant about DEA, but in any case, there was this difficulty. But in, in the result, in the end, I started looking at applications and I think it's fair to say that in the DEA history, um, I was really the one who started the whole analysis of hospitals with DEA, of banking with DEA, of physicians with DEA, and of government services. Uh, it was one of the benefits of starting early that uh, gave me a chance to um, sort of pioneer in these areas. Um, so this is a little bit of the early story. Um, the the seminar itself had no beginning or end. You know, you just showed up and Bill would just get out there and start putting these equations on the board and explaining what, uh, how effectiveness and efficiency is all about. And uh, um, and uh, we had all kinds of people in the room. Uh, the doctoral students were not just accounting or not just strategy or whatever, it was everybody. Uh, and Bill, by the way, was um, uh, in the Accounting Hall of Fame and also the founder of the Institute of Management Science so he was already uh, real, really highly regarded in two areas. Accounting is what brought me to him, but the management science is a part that I didn't know about. And uh, so, uh, and he also was the person who, if you go way back, introduced linear programming to business, which is, I guess, in the 30s or so. Um, so he describes a new methodology and says you can consider multiple inputs and outputs to evaluate efficiency. And he described in the context of program follow through which was the first publication and i'm looking at this i said this would be great this is this is a great idea uh, i looked at it and uh, um, it really would supplement and maybe even go behind the financial statements um, having audited harvard and have, having dealt with museum of fine arts it seemed like uh, this would compensate for a lot of limitations of financial statements and nonprofits, giving us a different purpose view of what's what was what was driving their their uh, effectiveness and efficiency. Um, and of course, we eventually realize it's, it's really the efficiency that we were talking about. Um, and uh, the other thing about financial ratios is it's limited to really one input to output. In other words, what's the um, cost per unit? Um, it's, a, it's a one input, one output. What's the, the, you know, what's the earnings per share? It's a, it's a one input, one output ratio. Whereas this would encompass a whole bunch of activities that are provided by a service organization like a museum and look at all the resources being used and say who's really using the resources most efficiently um, and then one of the uh, members of the audit uh, excuse me of the seminar was rajiv banker who i made the seminar he was a second year doctoral student i was a first year doctoral student and many of you of course recognize rajiv was another um real leader in the DEA area and still is, although his areas are you know, way beyond that as well. Um, and then when Rajiv and I are talking and he's showing me how you can take the linear programming and set the objective function 
denominator uh, to one and maximize the output and you can cleverly you know, reorganize simple um, uh, input output ratio and saying I want to get the highest output to input ratio and convert it into a linear programming very simply by just this very simple uh, transformation. Um, and I'll just say that along the way that uh, many of Bill Cooper's comments were real words of wisdom, I can still recall those. It's not just effectiveness and efficiency. Um, uh, now the thing about Bill was that he, uh, was, he did not have any children. So his students in a sense were like his sons and daughters and he developed very strong friendships with them. And for example, when he did a tribute book to his wife while he was at Harvard Business School, uh, the doctoral students were heavily involved with writing this volume for Bill. So I'm going to get into a little bit more of the history, but I have a comment I want to make about the perspective here. Um, there's sort of a family tree here. There are a lot of family ties here. And I've often said that the DEA uh, community is one of the uh, warmest and friendliest and uh, uh, you know most welcoming academic communities that I've experienced in my, in my experience in my academic career um, uh, and I say that and that extends to all these other um, people I, I recognize many of the people that are invited to do keynote address for this group for this uh, seminar and uh, but so Bill really was sort of like uh, it's part of, we were part of his family. Um, and I was, in a sense, a student. I was a direct student of Bill Cooper. Raji Banker was another one. We were at Harvard Business School. Another founder of DA, Abe Charnes, um, he had a student named Larry Seaford, who you probably recognize. And he was at University of Texas at Austin. And of course, he, like Bill, had many, many other students. Um, and I mention that because then Larry Seaford, he had a student named Joe Zhu, who is now at University of Massachusetts. Uh, and, uh, I think that's, well, I'm sorry, Joe studied with Larry at University of Massachusetts and he's now at, at um, WPI, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Um, so you can sort of see that uh, Larry was Abe's student, I was Bill Cooper's student, and Joe Zhu, who you recognize as, the, as one of the um, supporters and yeah, really, Founders of this conference um, was Larry Seifert's student, and you can see the, cha the chain to uh, Abe Charnes. So I just want to say something about Joe, Professor Joe Zhu, um, and I wrote it down here, and I want to make sure it's not misunderstood. That um, I, I say here, there are many talented and outstanding individuals who have technical ability and understanding how to develop and apply DEA. None, to my knowledge, are more capable of understanding and developing DEA than Joe Zhu. Um, and that's, I stand by that. I'm not saying he understands more than anybody else, but I don't think there's anybody else who knows more, is more depth at it than he. Um, and I want to add one other person, which is that uh, you have Charles and Cooper, um, but there's another person who popped in in the 90s. His name is Professor Joe Parody. Uh, at the University of Toronto, and he is he's there uh, right now, and he's still teaching there. Um, he's a actually he was a, a chemical engineer uh, and a, an entrepreneur, but he left his entrepreneurship after a very successful business and uh, entered the academic world. And while he was there, he came across DEA, and in the nineties, he became an incredible advocate. Um, and he became a developer of DEA, and he became a leader, uh, developing quite a number of doctoral students and supporting conferences and on and on. Uh, and I just want to mention that uh, Joe, uh, in a sense, uh, when I think of Charles and Cooper, uh, I personally think of Joe as being essentially one of the, shall I say, the next generation founders and leaders in DEA. Um, and of course, there are many, many others, and I don't really need to, I'm not going to try to mention all the others uh, or mention the other ones that I have great respect for because there are many. Um, I just want to sort of highlight this, and uh, I just want to say that as I go forward, I am deeply indebted to um, Professor Zhu, Professor Parity for their support, 
and wisdom in helping me in my DEA work over the last 20 years. So just moving on, um, I get to uh, understand what DEA is all about. And um, I you know, get very interested in it. And I said, well, maybe I should do this as my doctoral work. You know, maybe that would be my dissertation. Um, and uh, I had a very applied orientation. I had already been working at, at, at a small business. I'd been working at a museum. I was working as, a, as an auditor and a CPA. Um, uh, so the question I had was, does it work? It looks really fantastic. So I started, so I, and this time I'm not really gonna start with a little bit of a, sort of just a little bit of a path, just walking you through where it all went. I created an artificial data set where I knew what the, you know, what the efficient relationship would be between outputs and inputs. And then I was able to throw in this artificial data set, ones where we knew it was inefficient. And of course, there's no code. So each time I did this, I had to run the whole thing over and over again. And I forget how many units there were. And I used to use the term decision-making units. I just call them units or whatever. But in any case, uh, you had to rerun it time after time. Um, the word was that Abe Charns and the University of Texas had a code. Uh, and eventually, in the early 80s, uh, Professor Iqbal Ali uh, came to uh, UMass from Texas, and he brought his code, IDEAS, and that made it a little easier later, but uh, I wasn't using the code to begin with. So I applied DEA to this artificial data set. And as you see, it says it does work. That, that was the, it was a happy result. I could, I could find real inefficiencies. I couldn't find all the inefficiencies, but it does not incorrectly identify efficient units as inefficient. There were no false negatives. In other words, it was a way of saying who's the most efficient and where are the inefficiencies. It doesn't find all of them, but when you find one, it's real. And that I think is very important, which means that if you find, if, if I find an area where an organization could be doing better, and you say, why can't you do that? Um, at least if you're challenged, you'll be able to say, well, I, I know that the, you could do better based on this information, that this, this doesn't error in that, in that way. If there's inefficiencies, they're really there. Um, so the next question was, okay, if it really finds inefficiencies, can you identify useful insights for nonprofit organizations reliable enough to make decisions to enhance operations to reduce costs? Can it really be useful and actually improve operations of, for example, a nonprofit organization. So I decided to try that. And that actually was, again, my thesis. I started taking, getting data on academic medical centers, basically teaching hospitals in Massachusetts. Um, and I did that and, uh, uh, and the results were uh, really quite interesting. I, um, um, I did my dissertation on teaching hospitals. Um, and after I would get the data to, to, from the DEA and decide and understand what it was saying were the efficient and inefficient units, was that uh, correct? Was that meaningful? So to answer that question, I put together a panel of experts who uh, analyzed the DEA data, who understood the hospitals, and, and they concluded that in fact, it was identifying real inefficiencies, that the, that the inefficiencies in some of the teaching hospitals were real, were real, and actually you could even identify what that was all about. I still remember one of the hospitals near me, they said it had too many nurses, and they, uh, one of the experts said, that, that's right, they do have too many nurses. They purposely like a lot of hand-holding, and that was, you know, you could decide that that's inefficient because it was extra, extra nurses. It was a, a real finding, and the question what you want to do about it, that's a, it's a management question. But it was identifying things that these experts knowledgeable with these, about these hospitals couldn't answer. Um, so I ended up doing my thesis on uh, my dissertation on teaching hospitals. And I'm either the second or third DEA dissertation. You have to ask Raji how, what he thinks my number is, but it doesn't really matter. It's, no one's counting really. Um, so Bill goes to um, the University of Texas in Austin and joins 
his uh, really longtime colleague, Nick Charns, down there. And I joined the Sloan School at MIT, in the Management Science Group in 1981. And while I'm there, I said, well, let's, let's see where else this could be useful. So I said, maybe bank branches. I had a student named Franklin Gold, and uh, I, uh, I said, maybe we could try it. Franklin got some interested in DEA. I showed, showed him this. They had to do a thesis, and a like master's thesis. And uh, maybe uh, banks would be a good place. You know, branches, uh, they have multiple outputs, multiple inputs. They have all kinds of services. They have deposits, withdrawals, safe deposit boxes. Um, and uh, so I had a acquaintance at one of the uh, one of the banks in town. Uh, I got them to let us use their data. Uh, Franklin gathered the data together. We started applying it and ran the numbers and identified which branches, for example, were uh, looked like they were doing well, they were efficient, and which ones were inefficient. And then we took the data to the group, to the management and uh, showed it to them. And they said, gee, this looks really sensible. You found real efficiencies that we really hadn't identified. Um, and that, um, you know, that is pretty interesting that we hadn't really seen this before. We hadn't ever looked at data this way. Uh, maybe it could be valuable. And I was thinking as well, maybe it could be valuable for, for profits as well. At which point uh, I put this, in the form of a Sloan Management Review paper. Um, it was a, an article um, that was published by Sloan Management Review. And um, to this very day, I think the article was actually published around 1984. Uh, I still believe it is the, it is in plain English. It's a simple linear program explanation that describes the potential of DEA in very, very simple direct terms that a manager could understand. Um, and, and in fact, there were some managers that did read it and understood. So I got a call from the Canadian government, I'm part of it, from it's called the Department of Supply and Services, um, which is like the GSA in America. And uh, they said, maybe you could use this uh, to help us understand our branches, because we have different offices throughout Canada that do purchasing for the government. Um, so I did that project. And then around the same time, I had, there was a PhD student at Sloan named John Chilingarian, who's now a professor at Brandeis. And um, we were talking and I showed John DEA and I said, maybe we can see if whether if physicians can be impacted by this. And we started looking at cardiac bypass operations, they're really cardiac uh, physicians and um, see who, who does, who is more and less efficient and effective as well uh, in terms of their handling of these patients. And uh, we actually tried to bring both together. We had uh, two, two dimensions. One dimension was efficiency and the other was effectiveness. And effectiveness really was a question of, does the person get better? They, they to use a term, morbidity and mortality. You know, are, are, are people survive and they end up leaving the hospital being better as opposed to worse. So we had two quadrants and, um, and it became pretty clear. We really want us to have efficient Positions, but who also are effective. We really had a choice. Maybe we want the effective one. We wouldn't care about efficiency, but we were able to find who were the most efficient and, uh, and also most effective. And uh, we use these terms morbidity and mortality. I have terms M and M's, and I always say that after that study, the M and M's candy never really tasted the same to me. Um, any case, so these were two: um, the government and the uh, physician applications all happened when I was at the Sloan School, and uh, each of these started generating quite a number of studies. Um, and the, um, I guess what I'd say is that at that point, I was pretty convinced that it really was working, um, that I could really find things that you couldn't see otherwise. It doesn't mean other methods aren't useful and there aren't other things to be learned from other methods, but DA was definitely providing new understanding new paths to enhance operations. Um, and it was confirmed by the work in, in the government, it was confirmed by the work in the media, um, you know, by, by the first study. But then I said, let's try this more seriously. So there was this bank consultant um, who read the Sloan article and said, maybe I can try this in this bank in New Jersey. Um, and um, 
So, okay, let's try it. He, he came up to Boston, asked me about it. I said, okay, let's get the data together and I'll run it for you. Uh, so we ran the results, um, put it together. Again, this was still using very slow computing. I didn't have a code yet. Um, and uh, we, we put the information together, summarized what the amount of inefficiency was in the inefficient branches and told them who the best branches were. Um, and basically at this point, we were starting to identify the inefficient units being inefficient branches and the best, the branches that are being compared to, uh, I use the term efficiency reference set, which was the term I like to use. Um, people use other different terms, but that's the one I use. And we told the bank who the best practice branches were, the and they're the ones that, against which the inefficient units were identified as being inefficient. And we gave them the information and it sat on their desk for a while. Then I called up this consultant and said, was anything happened? He said, well, look, I don't know, let's go meet in New Jersey, which we did. We sat down with the, uh, the senior manager. I think it was uh, not, not the financial manager, but the C, 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 CEO, the, ch the chief executive officer, the president. I said, what happened? He said, well, we reduced our annual operating costs by $12 million based on your information. So we were both sort of a little winded, <laughs> so, so surprised. And also, I was sort of interested to see that the consultant didn't raise that question to begin with. But here was the first clear evidence. That this is pointing to things that were really interesting, potentially valuable, potentially improving operations. And uh, the CEO described how they looked at the information, they sat on it, they mulled it over, looked at it, sort of looked around at these units and these branches and said, you know, could it really be the case? And eventually decided that in fact, yes, it really is, it's real. And that they, um, there are these things that would, they could do to actually improve their operations. And they actually were very motivated because they, the, the bank really had us in because they were looking for ways to improve operations. And they were pretty stressed in terms of finding ways to cut costs. So they did. And they attribute $12 million of savings to, to the DEA. Uh, the study I did with Canada, we also applied it and gave the government the information. Uh, but then I got a grant to go and see how it all went. And uh, I went up there and uh, started interviewing people after the fact. And they said, yes, it really works. In fact, they even sent out a memo saying, we think that you should be using DEA more in the government. Um, and uh, this was a case where we were comparing these units. Uh, they said, gee, you know, it's, it's very nice to have these, this many inefficient units and uh, we can help improve those. And I don't remember the number, but they said, aren't there others that are also able to sort of improve their operations? And up to then, we were applying DEA sort of in a pure state, you know, just saying inputs, outputs, find the use of these that maximize the efficiency. Um, and that's the rating, that's the DEA rating. Well, I said, but we know that some of those inputs are worth more than other inputs. So we could actually weight those inputs and outputs. So I was assigning weights back then. And uh, I think that was the first time that was done as well. Um, and eventually terms like weight restrictions were, was a term used. But we were doing that anyway, if you go into this, into the mining grid that describes what happened. And that was a way of increasing the power of DEA. And that was driven by management's desire to get more, inter more information from this to strengthen the results and provide more opportunities to improve operations. Uh, when we applied this to a, a health plan, this was John Chilingarin and myself, um, it was great because we can incorporate many inputs that uh, are used by the physicians, tests, whatever. Um, and um, we can also use various outputs, the kinds of um, you know, results they were getting. There were, there were multiple outputs and inputs that we had identified for each position. And in this plan, we had for every physician, these inputs and outputs, and we're comparing them. And uh, of course they, you know, Change the names, they had they, they coded the names, and we brought the results back to the chief medical officer. 
who was actually our sponsor for this project. And uh, the first thing he did was he ran into the next room and was quietly looking at it. And we were wondering what was going to happen. And he was looking at his translation so he could see which positions were the weak ones and strong ones. He was very curious. And uh, he totally felt the results were meaning, meaningful, that they were, there's a lot of useful information. As I sit here, I can't remember exactly the inputs and outputs we used, but he thought it was very useful, very meaningful, but it was not used. He did, he did not use it to affect physician behavior. And I think that there's a lot of room for that, and there have been studies where this has been done, and where it has been used, to make decisions about physician behavior and which ones are actually practicing in a more effective, more efficient way. But in this case, it was confirmation of the information, it was, but it was not actually used in that situation. Um, and, but, and still with all of this, the journals were still very slow to accept the DEA. Um, and um, it was also very frustrating because the reviewers back then, and maybe even today, as you know, that's, has their own view of this, is that, that they never really knew what the real weaknesses were. Um, they would really ask questions about things that were, you know, that they knew, but the real weaknesses were never really, most of the time, were not really identified by them. But the rest is history, and uh, people who are listening to this, if you've gotten this far, you're one of a group of literally thousands of uh, people who are done research in um, DEA, and uh, there are many publications, many books. I don't know if there's thousands of researchers, but there's really thousands of publications, 5,000 or more, and hundreds of books. Um, so the rest, there is the history did sort of say that there is something very real here, and that's why we're all here today, even uh, through Zoom, uh, to learn about this. Um, so that is a little bit of the story of DEA. Uh, and um, then the question was, how do you get management to, to do this? How do you get the management to um, use DEA? Uh, and that's something that has always been my interest. Uh, Joe Parody in particular you know, shared that interest. Um, and there were a few things that I found because ultimately I did end up getting Oh, at least five of the largest 50 banks in the United States who use it uh, under my um, direction. And uh, of course, many, many other banks have used it. Um, so what I found was that management had to be interested in trying something new, at least back then. Uh, and, not, and it had to be a manager who was not threatened by something that actually would find other ways of improving operation. And they had to be somewhat comfortable with quantitative methods. Um, the other thing is that even if you have one or two that are that way, you have to have a, enough to say yes to actually go forward. Um, and uh, you know, there are many, many organizations I talk with who are very close but didn't do it. Um, including, you know, I said I had five of the 50, but I probably had spoken with 15 or 20 of the top 50. Um, any case, um, there were several of these major banks where I did do, do these um, studies. And um, my focus has always been on uh, really applications and making it effective. Um, and what can we do to make this even more meaningful to management? So for example, I did do an application uh, of some, several of the bank applications, but one of them, you know, it, it ended up with you know, very substantial improvements. But along the way, um, we found that the best practice branches, several of the best practice branches were actually low quality. And the um, bank manager said, well, how, how can I really use low quality branches as, as a benchmark? That's really, it doesn't make any sense. And they said, stop the project. We're gonna work on quality for a while. So we stopped the project and months later, he called me back in and said, okay, we've worked on quality. Now 
that students analysis. And that sort of led to me doing quality adjusted DEA, where you basically filter out best practices that are low quality. So you end up with looking for high quality, efficient best practice units. Uh, it really has the, uh, it basically has the efficient reference set. Um, so things like quality adjustments, weight restrictions, um, input output ratios are all things that to me just come out of managers' interests. So the result is I had one Tomsona article back in 84 and then actually with Joe uh, Zhu we wrote another DEA article in also in the Sloan Manager Review, which again I think is one of the most understandable of all. And then uh, Joe Parody, Faye Tam, and I wrote a book on banking. And um, this note says it was a topic of one session because this slide really related to a 40 year uh, look back at DEA that was, uh, it was held in the UK about just a few years ago. Um, so, having said all this, this is a little bit of the, the history. Um, and um, yeah, it's really uh, been, to me, it's been a great journey. Uh, I, I'm still working on a, a new approach, which is a new application of DEA, which is to use DEA as a kind of an audit tool to see when there's unusual relationships between data. And what, if you look at the more recent um, Sloan Management Review article, you'll see that Joju and I are looking at DEA as a way of looking at unusual relationships between data. It's not necessarily inputs or outputs, and of course, that we mostly understand that anyway, but it's really looking at unusual relationships with, with data. DE has, a, has an incredible ability to identify that, to, to identify unusual relationships which generate other possibilities. So we're looking at unusual relationships within an organization where, let's say, for some reason or other, the amount of resources that the organization has and the amount of sales they have doesn't fit together in some of the units. And that's the basis for saying, well, why doesn't it fit together? It could be because there's an unusual situation where they, somebody's found a much better way of doing it, or somebody's doing a very poor job of doing it, or that maybe there's something wrong here. And as an auditor, maybe I can figure out what's wrong. Um, and if, if there's something wrong, maybe I should, as an auditor, maybe there's something that is misleading and maybe that raises questions about quality of the information that's in the financial statements. So it's, it's another example of applying DEA. And uh, so that, that's one of the things that I am working on right now. And um, so at this point, I'm gonna end with just, if, if you um, look at the next slide, there's a URL for YouTube, for Bill Cooper. And uh, what I'm gonna do is um, I'm gonna, uh, Put up. I'm not really that great at Zoom, although everybody's getting a lot better. I say we're we being everybody these days uh, in the with the COVID-19 is part of the Zoom generation. So I'm going to put this up, and and I'm just going to give you a, a, a half a minute of just seeing Bill Cooper just speak for a moment or two, and I hope that will give you enough interest to go back to this YouTube and watch the whole thing. And again, it was always driving a problem-solving view. When I started with hospitals, it was to solve the problem, to improve their operations. And it's when I went to banks, can we improve the branches? With physicians, can we find a better way of practicing medicine? Can we find a better way of practicing medicine that still preserves quality? Um, and then with the government as well. So, of course, this has exploded, and your work is, you know, way beyond this. I know, um, and, and it's, you know, utilities. Uh, it, it's just unbelievable. But I just thought I'd give you a glimpse of Bill Cooper, and, um, and then I will close the presentation.
Well, I'm sure this was not very professional. It's done once. I've been thinking about it a long time, and it's a, it's a perspective. Uh, it's probably the, uh, the one thing that I can offer that's a little different from what most of the uh, really highly respected other keynotes are able to offer. Um, and uh, it certainly is not as uh, cutting edge as what I'm sure many of the uh, participants in the seminar offer. I will be looking at some of those and look forward to that. Um, and uh, if for any of you who have lasted this long, I thank you very much. And uh, I also put my email address in the front. It's, I'll just say it, it's h.sherman at neu.edu. h.sherman at neu.edu. If any of you have gotten this far and can send me a note saying I did get this far, That'll be interesting as well. Anyway, thank you very much. And uh, I hope we found this of some interest. And uh, I, I, let me once again thank Professor Zhu for inviting me to this keynote.